Hey, and welcome to Fit Me to Rock Fitness Podcast, a podcast for people who want to get no BS information about fitness and know that fitness is about so much more than losing scale weight. It's about feeling confident in your skin and empowered in your life. I'm your host, Tura Virta, personal trainer, strength and nutrition coach, and most of all, a husband of my beautiful wife, Miriam. Each week, my guests and me will give you some no BS fitness tips and motivate you to take action in your own personal fitness journey as we talk about nutrition, exercise, mindset, personal development, and executing in life with enjoyable but still effective strategies. If your goal is to look better, feel, and be strong, and experience transformation from inside out, you, my friend, are in the right place. Thank you for jumping in, and now let's jump into today's episode. So welcome to Fit Me to a Fitness Podcast. This week, uh, I have an amazing guest, uh, James LeBeek. James is a, a registered sport nutritionist uh, working with the endurance athletes, and I'm excited for this conversation as uh, endurance sports is something where I'm not, uh, especially not in professional level, uh, specialized, and I'm excited to learn so much from James. So James, first of all, welcome to the show. Uh, would you mind tell a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. And first of all, thanks very much for having me on, Turo. I've been looking forward to chatting with you. So yeah, my main role now is as a nutritionist, and I kind of have two roles that I work with as a nutritionist. So I'm the nutritionist for Hurry the Food Up, and we're primarily a vegetarian website, which focuses on weight loss for females in a sustainable, healthy way. And then the other side of nutrition for me is with my own company, Nutrition Triathlon. And I work with amateur and professional athletes in a sports nutritionist role in performance, working mostly with triathletes and runners. Oh, amazing. So uh, can you tell something about the importance of nutrition in endurance sports? So what is the what, what are the most critical uh, nutrients and uh, what the athletes should focus on? Sure. I think probably the way to frame it to start with, and I might be a little bit biased here, but mm -hmm. I think nutrition essentially underpins all of it. So for the most part, I think it's worth caveating as well. When I talk about endurance sports, I'm generally talking about anything over perhaps 30 minutes in length, mm -hmm. and that's where nutrition really comes into play with it. But nutrition is the the kind of key component that ties it all together. So with endurance sports, you're spending energy. And to be able to do that effectively, especially over longer distance events, so I often work with Ironman athletes or ultra running athletes, we have to be able to have energy for that. And your daily diet plays a massive role in that in terms of how well you train, how well you recover and actually can complete your sessions. And often these are, might be 10, 15, 20 hour weeks. So you're training a lot and Nutrition is obviously a vital part of that. And then when it comes to racing as well, it's integral because what you've eaten in the days before does play into it, but you have to be able to take nutrition on board whilst you're racing. So it's kind of the the linchpin all of it, of all of it, because you might be able to train a lot, and a lot of people are very good at the training side of things. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the nutrition to back that up, it's you're kind of putting a lot of effort in, but not getting much reward for it. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, because that is that is something what I what I have seen like um, when I I work with a clients or somebody who is for example preparing for let's say ten k run race or or a half marathon or even even for marathon, but uh, just that how big role that nutrition actually plays like that you like like you said uh, most people they are very good at the training part they probably know what to do but then when it comes to uh, racing or or uh, that uh, actually the performance and there is missing that like they are not really sure how to eat what to eat how to help recovery so you can work with the better quality not only and obviously quantity also but uh, especially quality of your workouts it changes a lot with uh, with the nutrition so yeah how how you would say that how how do nutrients uh, need to change change like uh, if we when we talk like a before before event or race, uh, during the race and after event. So, yeah, we'd talk, phrase this in terms of endurance, nutrition. So 
if we're looking at before a race what we commonly have is kind of a three to four run-in period three to four day run-in period into the race Mm -hmm. and that's a really important time because that's where you're putting in the work from a nutrition point of view which is going to set you up well for the race so the main thing we're looking at in this period is carbohydrate loading Mm -hmm. so for all of these events or any that last over about 90 minutes Mm -hmm. we need to carbohydrate load because that's going to give us a store of carbohydrates for our body to use during the racing Mm -hmm. so we want to carbohydrate load and that is in a nutshell eating a lot of carbohydrates not more than you normally would to Mm -hmm. maximize your body's store of carbohydrates which is glycogen Mm -hmm. that's then going to help you when you're racing because it's going to reduce the likelihood of your carbohydrate stores running out and essentially mean that you're going to be able to perform as well as possible during that period as well so the three to four days before your event generally you lower the amount of fiber in your diet Mm -hmm. and that's because fiber is something that takes a while to go through your gut so normally in a healthy diet we love fiber and we want lots of it it's really good for our gut it's good for our cardiovascular health so very important but it's a bit of an issue for endurance athletes because it's one of the main nutrients which will sit around in the gut for a couple of days so on race day if you've been out running even for 90 minutes but we're talking then eight hour races that sort of thing Mm -hmm. it's more likely to give you gastrointestinal upset so tummy problems so it might increase the risk of bloating diarrhea cramps Mm -hmm. that sort of thing things which can really hinder your race Mm -hmm. so three to four days you reduce the amount of fiber and then in that 24 hour carb load period you're more or less focusing on white refined carbohydrates which surprises a lot of people as well so that's the time you might want to eat white bread you might want lots of sweets lots of sports drinks which also really feels really counterintuitive because you're not really doing much you're not really training but the advice is to eat loads of it just because it's so useful and is this this is uh, during the race or or before the race this is all the before period. And then this is like you said, the 24 hours before the race. Yeah, so the, the low fiber part starts that's, that's... Three, three to four days. Okay. And then I normally suggest carbohydrate loading for about 36 hours mm-hmm. because there's some really good evidence that shows that you can actually do it in about 24 hours and get to the optimum level of carbohydrate mm-hmm. stores. But I tend to say about 36 hours because it gives a little bit of leeway. It means if you haven't quite hit the required amounts or you might do a bit of easy light training, that Mm -hmm. sort of thing, it gives you a bit of a a buffer for it. Mm -hmm. So my advice is normally 36 hours. Then during the event, that's where we switch to essentially carbohydrate only. I'll caveat that as well and just say that for the most part, endurance athletes during racing should be focusing on carbohydrates unless they have a specific reason not to. So, for example, they might be following a ketogenic diet for health reasons or personal pre- preference if that's their thing. But usually during an endurance event, we're focusing on carbohydrates, which is the simple forms of carbohydrates, which most people know about. So it's like gels or sports drinks. There's some chew blocks, that sort of thing. But the idea is easy, simple to absorb carbohydrates that are very well tolerated by your gut. And carbohydrate there is the main source of energy. So we don't need fat. We don't need protein during racing. Mm-hmm. And that's what they really need to get them through the race. Mm-hmm. What is then your, like you said, that the fiber you, you want to limit or, or kind of uh, cut almost out what about then fruits like fruits are great source of fiber is there some fruits like obviously if you if i think some banana or apple or something they are coming like if you look like tennis players or somebody who i would i love to watch they most of them or they are eating banana during the game is there is there what is your take on fruits like a before the race or or during the event like so Bananas are a good example that are pretty well tolerated and good. The Mm. fruits to generally avoid are things with skin. So Mm. skin is generally quite fibrous and hard to break Mm. down and process. So that's going to be more likely to cause trouble. Mm -hmm. And some of the dried fruits or the ones which are classically good for our gut. So things like prunes 
apricots, that sort of thing, those are generally the ones to avoid. So mm -hmm. there is a bit of trial and error in this before the event period where people can just test it. And what I normally suggest is testing your carbohydrate loading protocol mm -hmm. in a period away from the race. So it might be a couple of weeks out. So you just test it, know, like understand how you feel, how it works for you, because some people will tolerate much higher amounts of fiber than others. Mm -hmm. And what works for some person, people just really won't work and they have to dial it back a lot. Mm -hmm. Fruits in general are fine. But again, you just have to kind of pick the right ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, what about the after event? What is uh, how to if you you have had some race, uh, how to recover? Like, uh, obviously, what I know uh, from my background, if I had some event, uh, my nutrition that would be to celebrate it, go out, have some couple of beers, and <laughs> and uh, what is? Uh, but how is the? Probably that's not the most optimal way. So, what is uh, how to recover and what to do after event? Yeah, generally the post-race beers aren't ideal for hydration. And what I generally say is try to get your nutrition immediately right, and then you can have the beers later on. Yeah. So there's a really nice way to remember the uh, after-race period, and that's with the four R's. So by that, we think of refuel, repair, rehydrate, and rest. Mm -hmm. So the refuel part, is carbohydrates. So we're specifically thinking about carbohydrates. Usually my advice there is one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight. Mm -hmm. So for a 70 kilo athlete, they consume 70 grams of carbs. Mm -hmm. Then we think of repair, that's specifically protein. Mm -hmm. You can do something like a three to one ratio of carbohydrates to protein, but I generally suggest at least 25 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. Then rehydrate is drinking lots of fluid. So generally as well, after an endurance event, I'll suggest fluid with sodium. Mm -hmm. So sodium is the main thing which you'll sweat out. It's an electrolyte which you sweat out, but it's vital for maintaining your blood pressure, lots of different mechanisms, but it will also increase the amount of fluid you actually absorb. Mm -hmm. So ensuring you get fluids in, and generally I'm looking for at least 500 mils fluid per hour for the four to six hours after an event until you start feeling better and peeing regularly and clearly. Mm -hmm. Then the last one isn't necessarily a nutrition tip as such, but it's rest, which means you take some time to properly recover and actually give yourself some downtime because triathletes especially like to go straight back into training and get mm -hmm. back on it, whereas actually you need just some downtime to allow your body to just reset and settle. So what is what are, what are then uh, most common like there was a very good uh, points of those uh, especially fiber what I have never heard before like carbs kind of uh, makes a lot of sense uh, but uh, to avoid in fiber what are then the most common uh, or some common mistakes what endurance athletes athletes uh, make with their nutrition uh I would say from experience there's probably two main mistakes which I see and that's not eating enough calories overall mm -hmm. and not eating enough carbohydrates. Now, you mentioned earlier about what are the most nut uh, important nutrients to focus on. I think I kind of missed it, but we can talk about that now because the way to think about it is like you're building a house. So you want to start at the foundations and work upwards. And a lot of people think sports nutrition is really complex or you're focusing on those little bits of the diet to like eke out performance mm -hmm. whereas actually the most basic parts of sports nutrition are the most important and will make the biggest difference for any athlete whether that's amateur or professional so number one not eating enough so it's really common for athletes or endurance athletes to not realize just how much energy they're expending and they don't eat enough to cover that i think there's two parts to it one is that it's an unconscious mistake so they just don't realize how much they need to eat and how much they need to fuel their training mm -hmm. and i think the other is that there's a bit of a tendency within the endurance sports and triathlon and running that lighter and leaner is better which mm -hmm. isn't necessarily always the case but i think that leads a lot of people and historically from those that i've worked with 
worrying about how much they're eating. And mm-hmm. so that that skews them into slightly under fueling rather than over fueling because they worry about putting on weight. So that's a massive mistake. And that is pretty much the building block of good endurance nutrition is eating enough in the day because the rest you can kind of build upwards and mm-hmm. fine tune. But if you make sure that you're eating enough, you know you're covering enough for their general health mm-hmm. and making sure their basic needs are covered. Then not eating enough carbohydrates is the other one. So again, it's it's funny when you actually start talking about to people and showing them and explaining how much carbohydrate might be in a certain food and how much of that they need over a day to hit their training volume. And we're mm-hmm. talking five hours, 10 hours, 15 hours of training a week. You need a lot because you expend a lot. Mm-hmm. And for those of your viewers, if they don't necessarily know about energy systems, we've generally got carbohydrates and fat are our two energy sources. Fat is essentially unlimited. So the average person will have 50,000 calories worth of energy stored as fat, and they'll have 2,000 to 2,500 calories stored as carbohydrates. And that's if they're fully stocked to start with. And if people might use up 500, 600 calories worth of carbohydrates in one bout of exercise, and you repeat that, and also you have your general needs, you realize actually you need a lot to keep up with that. So those are kind of the two big things and are essentially the cornerstones of nutrition. And then you work up from that, then you be a bit more specific. So then you look at how much protein you might be eating a day. Are you eating enough fruits and vegetables? Mm -hmm. Are you eating enough and timing your meals? Those are the more nuanced bits, Mm -hmm. but the basics, the eating enough and eating enough carbohydrates, if people get those right, they're at least safe and then they can build upwards. Yeah, and probably that uh, actually that performance is going to improve already with those things. Like then, if it's if you what I would say that like you mentioned like about meal timing, everything those is those are then probably like uh, things what uh, like more advanced, more kind of professional level you are, more you start to focus on those like they are maybe zero point five percent improvements. But the biggest takeaway is just uh, probably having enough calories, having enough carbohydrates for for endurance sport. Like, and then after that, when you get those right, you start to focus on other things. Like, there is always uh, something to focus more on. Exactly, yeah, because there's no point focusing on dialing in your new, your meal timings if mm-hmm. you're not eating enough over the whole day because yeah. it makes no difference. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's the. For me, it's it's the most important, like because you hear now, especially in the social media, there is so much information now. And uh, and then like uh, you could talk like what is what makes a uh, very little difference. Obviously, it matters too. But like you said, before you focus on that, what makes a zero point five percent difference? Focus on that. What makes gives a lot more. Like makes that ten percent or whatever. Like even bigger impact on that event. So uh, next thing what I wanted to talk is a protein intake as a vegetarian lifestyle. You mentioned you are a vegetarian, work with the vegetarian people. And uh, and uh, it's uh, from my experience too, when or, or all people who I, I'm not vegetarian myself, I don't eat a lot of meat, but I have a lot of clients who are eat, or eat or same or are vegetarian. So what is, uh, if you are vegetarian athlete and uh, what is always going to be challenge is uh, protein intake so uh, is it what uh, do you have any tips for uh, protein intake for endurance or for at- vegetarian athletes yeah definitely so it's not impossible to get all of your protein needs as a vegetarian it's mm-hmm. definitely possible and there are plenty of incredible vegetarian athletes the trick is just planning and working a bit harder and understanding what are good protein sources for a vegetarian and then spacing those throughout the day so we know when it comes to protein intake it's really important to have a good amount of protein in every meal kind of oats or spreading it out over the day and not just in one area Mm -hmm. but there it's definitely possible so we want to look for high protein sources for vegetarians so eggs the classic staple which are brilliant 
And then we have dairy sources as well. Now, generally, I would tend to opt for low fat dairy sources, Mm -hmm. just because in terms of calorie amounts and protein amounts, the protein content is higher in low fat dairy. So like low fat Greek yogurt, Mm -hmm. you get a lot more protein in it. Mm -hmm. So that's focusing on on those and actually just building those into snacks or meals. And then things like low fat cream cheese, cottage cheese, great. Mm-hmm. Then it's using the alternatives. Now, a lot of people don't realize that you can get a significant amount of protein through whole grain carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. So you're thinking of rice, quinoa, pasta. Those actually do contain a reasonable amount of protein. Mm-hmm. And then when you pair those with other sources like legumes, and so beans, lentils, those sorts of foods, they can bump your protein intake up a lot as well. And then you've got other sources like tofu or soy which Mm -hmm. is really good. And the idea essentially is just combining them, not necessarily for anything like amino acid profile, but simply for more varied sources and other sources of protein. Because when you eat meat, it's very easy. You just have a chicken breast and that's everything. You just have to work that bit harder as a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's anything like, cause it's, it's uh, amounts what you have to eat. They are like, uh, it's uh, like, like you said, it's uh, if you have a, 100 grams of chicken breast it's that easier to get your 25 grams of protein than uh, if you want to get it from like uh legumes or or from some other other uh it's uh amounts what you must eat they are a lot higher so is there is there some tips uh what you would like to share on planning for vegetarian athletes like how to how to think about it uh, and uh, you had already some good uh good tips what you shared but is there something like specific how you would uh, what tips you would like to share so the way i would do it would actually be the same as a meat eater or anyone who eats anything when it comes to planning so what i like to do when i so when i work with athletes i try to get them to have a standard baseline of their food so what i mean by that is have a core setup of their food which they can stick to every day and then tailor according to their training. So you might start with something like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the classic three meal setup. And what I encourage them to do is build a foundation of meals, which they're happy eating regularly, and they enjoy and could eat day in day out, and get those set for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And the idea between those is that they get pretty much close to covering their daily energy needs without training so we might be talking around like 1600 calories 1900 calories something like that depending male female and weight and then you build in snacks around that based on your training Mm -hmm. because it makes it a really easy way to understand how much they need to eat and then i try to get them as well to classify things into like small or big snacks Mm -hmm. and make them have a standard amount of nutrition that they'll take in that corresponds to their training. Mm -hmm. So for example, if they know they're doing two hours of training a day, they might have to eat two big snacks to work Mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. And then it means that if they don't train, then they can just have their baseline food and just eat as they feel hungry as well. Mm -hmm. So it might be then just having some fruit or Mm -hmm. a bit of yogurt on the side. And it just means that it helps them scale. So really they have to put a bit of work into their nutrition at the start to get comfortable and understand how because ideally you want to use their daily diet so what Mm -hmm. they're already eating because a lot of people feel that they need to eat something different or eat a certain way because someone else does where we know that that's not really the ideal thing because if you try to drastically change your diet it doesn't really work and normally people eat what they eat out of Mm -hmm. convenience comfort and cost Mm -hmm. and it fits in in their pattern so what you want to do is just tailor that and so it might be asking them as well to understand how much for example how much carbohydrate they're eating so Uh asking them just once or twice to weigh out how much rice or pasta Uh they might normally use in a dish and just say okay well this is actually what we need to get you at as a standard baseline Uh and then that sets that level and then you work up from that yeah no because this is what you just mentioned that is a that is like a that awareness if it's uh it is uh if it's it's basically for all it's you don't have to be athletes for normal people also 
when you are aware, like what, what most people don't understand, not only athletes, but uh, uh, normal people, how much if you have like, as an athlete, you want to focus on uh, carbohydrates, probably like you mentioned that that is the probably the biggest mistake that you don't get enough. And, uh, and to see that just to look how much carbohydrates you are getting from your um, in your daily diet without if you eat in a more or less in a normal days and uh, for other people for who are working more for let's say gaining muscle mass or or having like some normal for example weight loss goal or, or want to change body composition it's probably the protein which is the most important macronutrient it's uh, important for endurance at least too but because uh, it's a totally different thing to think like that okay i'm eating some protein or you know how much protein you are eating because it's uh, most people you know when i when i say like i would say that when i start working with people it's like 90 percent of people don't have are not even close to their protein goal and uh, what it should be and when you start to see that, that you are eating breakfast then what is your protein then they're like protein sources breakfast is i eat i have every second day one egg and uh that that is uh thinking how much protein and if you think yeah. that one egg has seven grams of protein more or less and uh and if your goal is to have uh 120 grams of protein for example it's you gotta eat a lot of eggs to cover that and it's kind of probably the same thing with the with the athletes that if you first step when you become aware how much actually carbohydrates how much protein and then like you said that uh, really like planning ahead uh making making those uh uh thinking like what what is your source of carbs what is your source of uh uh protein for meals and then just uh learning from foods what you actually enjoy eating and not uh because i i think that for professional athletes probably like a meal plan is a very good way but uh, if you think like a regular people like you can't follow a meal plan like on on uh on a point but uh just learning from foods what you eat on daily basis and then uh making small sustainable adjustments and uh everything gets a lot easier but, yeah that's it and it's it's the same for whether you're training for performance or whether you're for example trying to lose weight it's just you want to be a bit curious about your nutrition mm -hmm. to yeah. uh, explore it a little bit more because most of the time and i'm sure you've found this that if you're completely dictating what someone did, should eat they often don't do that well with it because mm -hmm. they need to have a, an element of buy-in and understanding mm -hmm. for it and actually get on board and they still want to have their own food choices yeah yeah no absolutely so what about then um <laughs> Uh, do you have any recommendations like for vegetarian lifestyle for protein supplements like uh, because obviously like you said that uh, uh, it's it's not it's it requires a lot of planning a lot of thinking and uh, if at some point you know like protein supplements it it makes probably sense uh is there any supplements you recommend or uh, specifically protein supplements you mean no no just all it, it don't have to be protein supplements it can be all supplements what are beneficial for uh, endurance so in part i would say this comes back to what we spoke about earlier in terms of to start with i don't like people to think about supplements because mm -hmm. i want them to think about their overall diet and actually mm -hmm. making more gains there i think mm -hmm. probably the the one which does have more merit than most would be protein powder or a protein supplement. However, I am very much of the opinion that ideally start without it and uh -huh. understand how you might be able to reach your goals without it uh -huh. and then make sure that you then when you use it, use it for a specific use case. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're really short on time or you might be traveling Mm -hmm. that sort of thing and basically don't just use it as a crutch mm -hmm. and understand more about your protein intake first and how it might fit in mm -hmm. but protein shakes protein supplements are very good for vegetarians if you're not eating oily fish or having a good source of omega-3s can be worth supplementing omega-3s mm -hmm. slight difficulty always the way in that the plant-based omega-3 supplements generally not ideal 
because we don't convert the components of that as well. So not ideal. Vitamin D mm-hmm. is useful, especially in England and yeah. probably a lot of Europe for yeah. the winter months. So yeah. NHS advice is during the winter periods or from about September to April off the top mm-hmm. of my head would be to supplement vitamin D. Mm-hmm. So that's worth it. Then we get into kind of the the nitty gritty side, which I really enjoy and could talk about for hours in terms of performance supplements. And we're thinking of things like creatine, beta alanine, those sort of mm-hmm. things. Now, again, there's two sides to this, which I like to come back to. One, first thinking about everything else, because when we're thinking of things like creatine, beta alanine, sodium bicarbonate, they're all performance enhancing and probably one of the few which are known to be performance enhancing however it really comes back to have you got the rest right in your diet because Mm -hmm. there's no point focusing on those again it's kind of like meal timings because you're thinking oh i'm gonna get this real good benefit from taking this but actually if you haven't got the rest right it's not really as useful and Also, because I work with professional athletes as well, and those who are in a higher performance capacity, supplements are far more important because those athletes are undergoing drugs testing Mm -hmm. for doping offenses, that sort of thing. That's Well, that's what we're trying to prevent. Mm -hmm. It becomes far more important. So you have to have talks with all of them to recognize or allow them to recognize the risks involved with it. And you're meant, or the athletes are meant to take notes. They're meant to have a list of all the supplements they take and their batch Mm. numbers and that sort of thing. So supplements actually become far more important than I would say the average athlete because they don't risk that, that kind of danger to their career. Yeah. But what is, what is like, uh, what are the tendencies? Like, what I'm, what I'm like, uh, I'm interested in creatine, especially because it shows like, uh, uh, there are so many studies, uh, supporting like, uh, uh, there are benefits of, of, uh, not only like, uh, athletic performance, but also a lot of, uh, normal, like a uh, health, uh, possible benefits, like Alzheimer preventing, uh, probably even some cancer. And, uh, when it's like, it's kind of natural source, it's not some like that, uh, I don't want that somebody is thinking like that, what you talked about drug testing or, or, or that kind of stuff like that, that those what we were talking, they are not like a protein powder, creatine, uh, vitamin D or omega trees or, or those kind of supplements. They are, you don't have to worry about, uh, it's more like a combinations of, uh, if you start to take pills from somewhere, but, uh, but especially creatine, like vegetarian lifestyle as it's a source of like a from coming usually from meat. And uh, and what is your take on, on creatine? So you're absolutely right. There's heaps of evidence for it from a performance point of view and into the other realms of health as well. You mentioned mm-hmm. cognitive function or cognitive, preventing cognitive mm-hmm. decline. So it's a very good supplement. It's very safe. When I talk about the risks, it's really, we're talking inadvertent doping offences. So the ways to mitigate mitigate that, if you want to consider it, is using things like batch testing for uh, supplements. So I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's something called Informed Sport, and there's other ones around where essentially manufacturers send their product or a batch of their product to another company who test it for sub supplement uh, for substances which are on the wada the world anti-doping agency's mm-hmm. prohibited list mm-hmm. so it's essentially making sure that those athletes are doing whatever they can to minimize the risk of contamination and that sort of thing because a lot of, or some supplements might be made in the same factory mm-hmm. as someone or another product line which might have substances which would be banned so uh-huh. it's just trying to minimize that risk and making sure that they know the actual benefits. Because again, when it comes to endurance sports, creatine doesn't, yeah. well, it's not that relevant. Yeah. So yeah. most of the function for creatine is short, intense movements. We're thinking of lifting heavy weights in the gym or kind of going to max effort, mm-hmm. maybe up to about 30 seconds mm-hmm. in yeah. total duration. 
might be some benefit if you're thinking of high intensity intervals Mm -hmm. and squeezing out a little bit but again there we're looking at cost versus benefit Mm -hmm. and actually whether that really works for them but it's a very safe and very very effective Mm -hmm. supplement yeah no makes makes totally sense uh so let's move on i wanted to talk uh, something about training so uh what are like you you are uh, uh specialized for triathlon but uh, in general for endurance sports so uh what are the fundamental mental uh, principles of training for triathlon or for long longer uh, endurance uh, sport probably the biggest thing to understand i would say is volume and intensity so by volume i mean how much you train so whether you're training an hour a day two hours a day 10 hours a week that the, that's the volume side of things then we've got the intensity side of things which is how hard you're going so mm-hmm. that might be you're going absolutely flat out and you're doing as hard as you can mm-hmm. or you're doing a very easy pace which is what we might think of as the endurance pace now Mm -hmm. for me the fundamental thing to understand when it comes to endurance training or triathlon training is that volume is king so Mm -hmm. the more you can do overall the better your performance is going Mm -hmm. to be so if you want to get good or you just want to start going towards that and you're looking at performance you need to get as much in as you can Mm -hmm. but that has to be a gradual build so one of the things which people often fall into a trap of when they look at endurance training especially triathlon is doing too much too soon and with three sports three disciplines so you have swimming cycling and running you want to train all of them train every day or do loads of sessions and actually especially when you first start out that's really not the best approach because you'll burn out quickly and you'll you'll just be overworking yourself so understanding that there's got to be this build period then the way I like to think about it, and there's lots of different rules or splits, would be something like 80-20%, uh, so an 80-20% split. So 80%, maybe even 90% of training, in my opinion, should be easy endurance training. So we're thinking of 60 to 70% of maximum heart rate. So really quite easy. And it should be it should feel easy. So this is the sort of thing which someone could keep up for hours and hours. And that's probably the biggest trap that endurance athletes fall into is they go too hard too much of the time. Yeah, no, and this is like, uh, just to clarify, this is, uh, it's, you are talking about zone two. If you have like a sport uh, watch or something, uh, this is what you, what is, uh, what you are telling generally yeah it's so it's slightly difficult in the in in endurance sports depending on who you talk to you'll have different zones so some people will have a three zone model and it yeah so i for that i might be talking about zone one i I was i was talking like if you have in your sport what's like most people have like a five zones but what is how to know like uh, because if you then like okay at least probably know if it's if you know your maximum heartbeat but if you don't know it how to say that what is that zone it's it's uh something what you like you said feels relatively easy and uh what i love to use is uh, is th- is that you can keep talking you can talk yeah. like uh uh what i how i heard it somebody said it pretty well that you you can talk like let's say not longer than 15 word sentences but you don't want to talk all the time like if you want to talk all the time you are probably it's too uh it's zone one or, or too easy and if you can't talk it's already already if you can't make like 12 word sentence without taking a breath uh, it's probably already too hard so absolutely i actually tend to stray on the even easier side of what you mentioned so i actually would opt more for endurance training of being able to take a full like essentially hold a full conversation so mm-hmm. there's a really nice the other thing that I use when talking to people is if they can breathe in through and breathe in and out fully through their nose Mm -hmm. they should be in the right area because the nose is obviously a bit harder to breathe in Mm -hmm. in and out through just smaller if you can do that then generally you're in the right zone for endurance Mm -hmm. easy endurance training and you said that 80 to 90 percent of your total volume should be on that zone 
That is exactly, that. yeah. Which is, for a lot of people, especially when they're coming into it, kind of blows their mind a little bit because yeah. it's often like, but I'm not going to be getting any benefit from that. Yeah. Like, I need to be working hard. I need to be yeah. sweating. I need to be doing that. But actually, totally the wrong approach for, for most people when it comes to endurance training. Yeah. And is this, is this like now we, you talked about uh, like the triathlon, but uh, this is probably the, is, is this principle applied this for like just some, let's say, a normal runner or something who want to, who is going to run now for, let's say, three times a week for an hour? Like, would you apply this principle also for that kind of person? Or are you talking specifically, specifically for athletes? Yeah, very good question. And the answer is, yeah, I would. So I would apply it to pretty much anyone. So if you're starting out, if you're elite, I would pretty much be going down this route for for almost everyone because they work on different parts of your metabolism and different energy pathways. And for most people in terms of health and the, the, the also the, the important thing to talk about here actually isn't just from a performance side of things it's longevity so yeah. longevity in terms of training and consistency because a lot of people and i've seen it so many times get very enthusiastic and it's awesome to see it mm -hmm. but they will just go high intensity after high intensity after high intensity and within a couple of weeks they are frazzled and they can't yeah. keep it going or they've got aches and pains and niggles because they've never really done that sort mm -hmm. of intensity and volume so by balancing out that 80 90 percent as easy training you also reduce the risk of doing it because it's still good for you and it's still healthy but you just won't feel absolutely exhausted or smashed and battered afterwards yeah and this is this is one of the like uh, biggest what i often when i when i talk when somebody wants to improve their running time and i tell that uh, you probably for you going easy it's a fast walking and yeah. then they're like that they are usually they are used to do like a, they go for a run like a 30 minute or one hour and then you know they are chasing that feeling what you get after running and if you don't if you go for a walk you don't feel to say you don't get that same kind of dopamine boost what you get uh, when you go for a run and if you don't you are not sweating you don't feel that you have done something but then uh, then actually that is you get a lot more benefits or or it's doing more good for you and 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 when you do it in a in a this way like a, like you said what, what actually uh like endurance athletes how they are training obviously speed is going to be different for someone who is a marathon runner or who is an athletic they are going to run probably faster than somebody who is just starting and for most people that is just simply walking yeah absolutely i think we or people undervalue how good it is i think it's a different kind of enjoyment and that's something well so for example endurance athletes generally know what they're trying to do and what they're trying to get to mm -hmm. but some of the people i work with are complete novices and they might be someone in their 40s or 50s who's aiming for weight loss they do not care about performance at all yeah and it's teaching them that that exercise is still good for them. And yeah, you don't get quite the same hit in terms of how pumped you feel afterwards, but it's a different kind. And often I think if they find the right exercise for them, if they find something which they enjoy and will do regularly, mm -hmm. they start understanding the the benefits of it and also like the mental health benefits of mm -hmm. getting out and moving and doing half an hour an hour of walking and how good that can make you feel yeah yeah exactly and what about then that 10 to 20 percent what kind of training that should be for uh, endurance athletes or someone who want to improve their endurance sport specific so i would always suggest context so that 20 percent might be very different and there's no hard or fast rule for it because it depends where someone might be in their season or it might depend on what their aim is so mm -hmm. in that area you've kind of got different zones again that you're working on so some might need to focus on high intensity intervals where we are working at 
for example, VO2 max. So mm -hmm. maximum amount of oxygen we can use. And we're doing a shorter amount of high intensity work. So it might be something like 10 to 20 minutes overall split up mm -hmm. into intervals. But for some people, it might be far more important to work on what's called the lactate threshold. Mm -hmm. So where their lactate is accumulating at pretty much the same rate that they're getting rid of it. And that might be for endurance athletes, an extremely important place to work on. And that might be working on what's called tempo or threshold. Mm -hmm. So it's intervals that you can sustain for longer than the classic high intensity, three minutes, four minutes, but it's working at a different part of your energy system and that might be really useful because that athlete for example might not be very good at that and by raising that that gives them a huge performance benefit they might be very good at vo2 max that might not be the, be their ceiling so it's very much sport specific and context specific on the athlete but essentially we're looking at kind of 85 percent plus max heart rate mm -hmm. and just understanding uh, probably i'd say another issue that then people fall into is going too hard Mm -hmm. too frequently yeah. so people often think during the high intensity that 10 percent, it's as hard as possible uh -huh. whereas that might not be the case and for example if you're doing tempo threshold workouts uh -huh. that can often feel pretty easy for most of it it does start uh -huh. to bite but it's really about understanding your personal zones and what you need to work on and understanding that harder is not necessarily better yeah yeah, this is, this is, I think it's the mental, mental thing of this is just the trusting the process and, uh, and not because, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it don't always working smarter doesn't mean working harder. And this is, this is the, what makes like a kind of programming and, uh, this training part that it's, it's for me, I can tell personally, like I'm, I'm not an endurance athlete, but, uh, now when, uh, following actually training program and seeing I when I was I was my background is I was professional ice hockey player and I was working hours and now but I didn't I didn't have any plan or or plan was not very good and I was spending so many hours but now when I'm I'm older I'm working with the plan doing things what actually matters more and I'm seeing a lot better results for myself even my goal is not anymore uh, improve that much my athletic performance just for overall health but uh, when you have a plan would and trust the process it makes it's such a amazing feeling like that because i used to be also like uh, like most people they are working harder is always better if you can do like uh, go to the gym every single day and when when i tell that you probably are going to see better results if you go to gym say three to four times a week and uh, and no but they don't want to believe but then when you actually give your body time to recover and uh, obviously it's a uh, in uh, endurance sport it's uh it's uh it's more about volumes but also like uh, having that principle because if you like you said that for most people if you go for a run uh just always same same round uh same speed uh or or trying to make it that you you, the only goal is that you feel exhausted or tired and good after that workout. Uh, you are probably going to see, like obviously in the beginning, you probably, probably going to see some results. But in a long term, uh, if you actually follow this principle, what you just said, you are going to see so much bigger difference. That's it. And it really, it's consistency. And that's whether you're training for performance, whether it's weight loss, whether it's just healthy living, it's consistency and it's finding that balance. And for a lot of people, it's understanding that heart, it's training smarter, living smarter, not necessarily harder. And yeah. you want to be able to do it over time, which also means picking something you enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like you said, consistency part of this is it doesn't like that getting rid of that all or nothing thinking and that if you can't work out three times a week, it, then you don't do anything at all. So if you you have we all have busy periods of life when you can't do anything, but in those weeks or days, even a couple of minutes, just first of all, providing yourself that you are doing this and making a little bit better than you would normally do, that makes such a big, big difference. Yeah. 
So we are running out of time. Uh, uh, James, is there anything you want to share where to find you from social media, how to work with you, uh, anything you want to share? Sure. Uh, first of all, also thanks. That's It's been a really good chat. I've really enjoyed speaking Thank with you. Thank you. It was really pleasure. Um, so I'm on Instagram and YouTube and my website, Nutrition Triathlon, for all the handles or nutritiontriathlon.com. And again, all the handles, hurry the food up and hurry the food up.com. Come check us out. We, we have vegetarian website, uh, meal plans and recipes. And then I do lots of free videos for nutrition for endurance athletes, which hopefully help people out with their goals. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, please check out, at least check out. I can't uh, force you to follow. Even I would recommend to follow James. But uh, check, I will put in show notes or links. So thank you for uh, the interview and talking with me. It was a pleasure. And uh, talk to you soon. Hold up, friend. Do you love Fit Me Turo Fitness Podcast? If so, the best way to say thank you is to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review on iTunes. I know every podcaster wants you to leave a review, but it's because those reviews help the podcast to reach more people. I truly want to know what you think and if this particle episode resonated with you, would you also please share it? Either send a link to someone who you think will find it valuable or take a screenshot and post it into your social media and tell your friends and family why they should listen it. Make sure you tag me so I can hear your feedback and give you a little love. And you know, if you aren't already following me on Instagram or TikTok, that's the perfect time to hit that follow button. Thank you for being here and listening to Fit Me to a Fitness Podcast.